Welcome back to Kaust Live. We are talking about designing tomorrow with inventors, artists, uh, entrepreneurs. And joining us in the studio now is Anne Makasinski. She is a Forbes 30 Under 30 nominee, uh, among many other things, and I'll let her talk about that. Anne, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so we're here talking about during our fall enrichment period, which we have three uh, separate times during the year when uh, Kaus sort of takes some time out to explore different topics. Mm -hmm. um, so your inventions and your work over the past years uh, fits nicely into that. So talk to start with a little bit about how you got into being an inventor. Um, well, I wasn't given many toys as a kid. Um, my first toy was actually a box of transistors and other electronic parts. Hmm. And from there I would take garbage and just spare parts from around the house and hot, hot glue gun them together and create inventions. Hmm. Um, of course, I never worked, but the idea of taking the resources around me and piecing them together to make something better was something that just kind of naturally came. Mm. Um, and I also loved talking and doing plays and speech lessons, so my parents kind of noticed my interest for talking and tinkering and suggested that I join the local science fair mm. um, in Victoria, B.C., from where I'm from. Um, so I did a total of 10 science fairs in seven years. Mm. Yeah. Uh, are, are either of your parents uh, inventors or scientists? Uh, my dad, you could say he's a tinkerer, but my mom and dad are never were never engineers. My mom studied ESL, and my dad's degrees are in education and film. So um, I think the love for electronics and film, or just science and art in general, is kind of throughout spread throughout my family. Mm -hmm. And how did you uh, get into the different science fairs? Was uh, is there a big program in your school? Or no, my they... school didn't support science fair. Oh. Um, I was the only kid doing it, and they didn't really tell other students that there even was a science fair going on until I started getting some publicity for it. So, um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, there's a local science fair called the Vancouver Island Regional Science Fair that anyone could apply to. And then from there, if you qualified, you could go to the Canada-wide science fair. Yeah. Um, so I went to that a couple times too, and then I also went to the Intel Science and Engineering Fair a couple times, as well as the Google Science Fair. Right. And then there's a science fair in Europe as well. I'm not sure what it's called, so it really depends like where on the globe you are. Mm -hmm. But the Google and Intel Science Fairs are the more international okay. ones. Yeah. So give us a, a quick list of uh, sort of your your top your top wins. Obviously, the, the, the latest one is the, the Forbes 30 Under 30, mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the Intel ISAF. Um, what, what other uh, things have you competed in and, and, and done well? Yeah, I don't really like talking about myself. <laughs> um, I, I've been on Jimmy Fallon a couple times showing right. my inventions. Uh, I think I was named Times 30 Under 30 when I was... 15 or I just turned 16 right after the Google Science Fair. I didn't even know what it was until people were like, hey, you got named this. And I was like, what is it? Right. Um, just different, you know, awards. I think I got so, some sustainable entrepreneurship award mm. um, a year or two ago that Obama got as well. It's, there's a lot of things, but the main thing is if my inventions just inspire other kids to invent, that's what's more important to me. Cool. Well, so so that leads me to how has that notoriety or that recognition, how has that changed your creative process, if at all? It doesn't change my creative process. Mm -hmm. um, they're just things I can put on my LinkedIn profile now, you know. Um, I don't know. It's I think, it's, if anything, it just adds more pressure to me to actually create things, um, perhaps not in a good way, but... Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's... they're. It, the titles and you know awards or whatever they've helped me progress further um, to and they've helped expand my audience for speaking and yeah. inspiring other people so yeah. I'd say that's the main way yeah you you've um, you've done some TED talks as well what's the yes. experience of that is that is that pretty nerve-wracking how is that um, well I do talking as my one of my main jobs so um, I, when you did science fair, you would have to present your project over mm. and over to people who were both very experienced in the sciences and people who weren't um, for who knows how many times each day when you presented. So public, speak, public speaking was something that didn't really, wasn't nerve wracking to me at all. It's still not. I find it for some reason very comfortable to speak to strangers, perhaps <laughs> more <laughs> than to close friends. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but 
I don't know. I've done, I think, five TEDx talks. I don't like any of them. Well, I like them, but I'm not, I can't watch myself speak. I'm very overcritical of everything, for myself at least. Um, but they were fun experiences. I think the first one that I gave was a couple days after the Google Science Fair, and I'd never done any, you know, talks before about my work, and I was, I was nervous for that one, and I did it half in an English accent, apparently, because that's what happens when I get nervous, so. You speak as though you're British. Yes. Very good. So then the notoriety is coming on the back of a couple of notable uh, things that you've invented. Uh, and I know that you talk about those a lot, but uh, uh, tell us the two main ones that are, that are sort of out there. Um, so the two main inventions are, uh, one is called the hollow flashlight, which is a flashlight that runs off the heat of the human hand, and the other is called the e-drink, which is a coffee mug that takes the excess heat of your hot drink and converts it into electricity. So eventually, if you drink a lot of coffee or tea, you can give your iPhone or iPod a boost of energy. Mm -hmm. Have you considered uh, running that off of any other uh, sort of hot devices? Maybe a Well, yeah. I mean, there's a guy who, like, put Pelte tiles, which is what I use to harvest electricity, mm -hmm. on, um, on fires, camping fires, to charge your phone when you're camping. And that's... Yeah. You know, you're getting a couple hundred degrees Celsius temperature differential. So, of course, you're going to generate a lot of electricity from that. I'm working with, especially with the flashlight, less than, you know, 5 to 10 degrees Celsius temperature differential. So the mm -hmm. amount of electricity you're producing is very small. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking I have been working on some new applications um, of where to put the Pelletier tiles. Right. So, yeah. Um, so you're, you're in undergrad now. Mm-hmm. Um, so what are your plans uh, academically? Are you doing a, a STEM undergrad or are you No, I'm not. Direction? I'm doing a STEAM undergrad. So I'm, that includes arts and design. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to push more for STEAM instead of STEM. Mm -hmm. um, so my degree is in English literature. I do my arts inside of school and I get to learn about film and storytelling through mm -hmm. my degree and I have my business and work on technology outside of school and so that's the sciences. Mm -hmm. um, if I was studying engineering with my outside of school schedule I would be flunking it easily because I'm you know missing four weeks of school you know and stuff like that so um, my I, I mean like I plan to get my degree I'm just going to learn you know that's more of what it's about and it, just because you're in college doesn't mean you can't start working on your career outside of school. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't being in college doesn't define you just as a student. You can do so much more with your time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm writing a children's series right now, and we're trying to get a show started for me, as well as working on licensing deals and patents and speaking. So there's a lot going on, but yeah. Well, um, what is it like? Um, I, I think it's probably glorified a lot to be a young inventor, and people want to hear a lot about your ideas and how you came up with them. Um, what is it like to be a young entrepreneur and have all the business aspects of that? Talk about that. I don't know. I, the word entrepreneur is so overused, in my opinion. Like anyone can say, like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I would classify myself more as a tinker, inventor, or just in general a creative person. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have my own company, but I'm not actively like working on my business every day and doing all the numbers and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I never wanted to be someone who had my own company, and I think there's a definite difference between being an inventor and entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So an inventor is someone who has this idea and they make a physical product or, you know, app or whatever they, no. Uh, they make a physical product. Mm. That's an inventor. An entrepreneur takes that product and puts it on the market. Mm. Um, and so sometimes those two can come together and you can be both, but it's also important to emphasize to youth that being an inventor is just as acceptable or cool as being an entrepreneur. Mm. Um, even though we're seeing the word entrepreneur glorified kind of these days, I'd say more than an inventor. Yeah. Right. Right. It's become a bit of a buzzword then. It is a buzzword. Mm -hmm. That's why I prefer not to use it on my <laughs> business cards. <laughs> um, you're, you're giving a keynote. Um, mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about what you're going to be talking about. Um, so I'm talking about, I forgot the title of it. <laughs> I think it's something along the lines of, oh, the art and science of invention, I believe is the title. Um, so, you know, I'll talk a little bit about growing up, 
and my science fair experience and inventing and that sort of creative process for me and also talking about how we should be bringing arts and design into STEM programs um, and how it's really important to have a balance of arts and sciences to be um, successful in either field. That's just my humble 20 year old opinion. Um, well, you're in, yeah. you're in one of those programs, so, t so talk a little bit about how that, uh, how you think that's been different or beneficial that there's been arts in that. Um, well, you know, if you only do sciences or you only do arts, you're missing out on a lot of stuff. And it's interesting because mm. we've usually classified scientists as people who are very logical, very straightforward, mm. when in reality scientists are some of the most creative people that you'll meet, but they just mm. don't see themselves as being creative. Um, so it's really important to emphasize to students in STEM, like, hey, there's this whole other world out there with arts and design. And mm. it's like Nobel laureates who are in the sciences, I think, believe like 17 times more likely to, I want to say it's either be a poet or musician than the regular scientist. And there's been many studies done and observations that show the correlation between sciences and arts. Like Albert Einstein, great scientist and mathematician, and he was also a first class violinist. Um, and there's a lot of things like that that I think it's really important for people to hear about. Other than just writing, um, do you enjoy any other artistic pursuits? Uh, I've played piano since I was in kindergarten. I can play almost almost every Elvis song, <laughs> so learning some. I'm very much into film. I was raised on silent films and 1920s, 30s films. Um, I hope to do some of my own later in my life. Um, I, what else do I do? I used to play violin. I would do speech lessons. I would do a lot of plays and drama slash musicals. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm terrible at drawing, but I do enjoy drawing and sketching, and sketching really helps when I'm coming up with new invention ideas. Mm. That's usually the primary way I'll, I'll put all my ideas down on paper. Mm. Um, I love dancing as well, but I don't, I'm not a professional dancer at all, but I love dancing in my room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, talk about other, if there are any, uh, other sources of inspiration for you, wh whether that's other young inventors, whether that's uh, music that you, you like, uh, outside of Elvis, of course? Um, hmm, outside of Elvis, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think I just find inspiration from people's problems around me, and mm. if they have a personal conne connection to me, then it's definitely much more pulling for me to create a solution for them. Mm. Um, otherwise, you know, I have a lot of role models from, when I was in grade six, I would have like an obsession with a different person each year. Mm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Just inspiration, I think, is always around you. It's just whether you choose to look at it or look for it yeah. or not. So, so the inspiration for the hollow flashlight, for example, came from a family member in the Philippines. Uh, a friend a in friend. the Philippines. Yeah. Um, it, she lives in. She came from the same village as my mom did. Okay. Uh, it's a very small place, um, and she told me on Yahoo Messenger back in the day that she had failed her grade in school because she didn't have any light to study with at nights mm. and she had no electricity. And that shocked me that, you know, I was around 14 at that time, that someone mm. else around the world, just in a different place, didn't have something as simple as light, which I had, and I was just like her. So I decided to start basing some of my science fair projects around her problem. Right. Um, and has that, or are there plans for that to translate into, I mean, is that something you aspire to, um, to create inventions like this and then go and see them implemented in, in some places or? Well I hope the flashlight gets implemented. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be another year or two is my guess but. Mm -hmm. um, another year or two before it's developed as a fully No, before product, it, it's before it's um, sold or distributed. I see. Um, yeah obviously when I make an invention I mean I never thought about doing that with any of my previous work but now mm -hmm. that I have companies or brands who are interested, I can start thinking, okay, well maybe I could make an invention that this company would want. Yeah. Um, but that solves a problem that a lot of people experience every day. Mm -hmm. um, but before, you know, there were just science fair projects that I was, and I'm, I just love tinkering and mm -hmm. just coming up with new ideas. So, I don't know, yeah. Very good. Well, thank you for coming in to speak with us and, and best of luck with your, your keynote and, and the rest of the time on campus. Um, uh, so, so Anne will be speaking uh, uh, later as a, delivering a keynote, and make sure to come back tomorrow uh, for another Kaus Live event, and that's all for us this evening.